It's a special day today. It's a special day. Uh, we talked about the history of the day. We talked about, and actually it's the fact that so many of you have chosen to take a day which uh, the government grants for you to spend on the beach or wherever it is that people spend every day and that you choose to spend your day here to, st to study Torah makes the day a very special day. Um, and today is the day that we mark the conclusion of studying uh, Tanya. Um, I've studied Tanya for many years. Um, and, but to study it in a group like ours and to start at the beginning and reach the conclusion uh, is a special occasion and is deserving of a meal, a festive meal as we have here tonight. Um, on the tables you have uh, a menu sheet but that's actually, that's just a deception. Because on the other side, we have a text of the time. Uh -huh. Every good book has a hero. Most good books also has a villain. Tanya is a good book. So Tanya must have a hero. Tanya starts off by describing the three categories of people, the tzaddik, the righteous one, the rasha, the rebellious, wicked person, and finally the benoni, in between. The hero of the Tanya is undoubtedly the benoni, the in-between person, the intermediate guy, or should we say, the normal kind of person. Now they tell the story of a Jewish man, an elderly Jewish man who got caught up in a car accident and he's lying on the street and there's blood gushing and there's everything's going on and somebody and the ambulance uh, is called uh, the paramedics are there and somebody finally taps him on his uh, shoulder and says sir how are you doing are you okay i make a living i'm okay <laughs> just regular is that is that a, a regular person who just goes through life what is the Benoni? Who's the villain of the Tanya? Let me tell you, it's not the Rasha. The Rasha hardly features in the entire book, maybe two or three chapters, where Tanya discusses the Rasha. I would say that the villain of Tanya is the Nefesha Bahamit, the animal soul. Not evil, not bad, just the egotistic, self-centered, self-centered, animalistic consciousness. Each of us possesses both. We have a godly and an animal soul. The selfless, altruistic consciousness, whose only desire is to serve God and be good, Who's calling? Is that the godly soul or the animal soul? That's the godly soul. But we also have an animal soul, which we just mentioned. And the tzaddik neutralizes his animal soul. So he can serve God uninterrupted. The rasha succumbs to his animal, animalistic self more or less often, depending on his particular level. The Benoni is constantly wrestling with and overcoming his desires and inclinations. Every day brings a new struggle and a defeat for the animal soul. Like the mountain climber that can't afford to rest even one hour, every constantly, always, either moving upward or moving downward but there's no just standing still. And with the Benoni, the mountaintop keeps on moving higher and higher. 
the higher he reaches, the further he can see. And he's constantly, never gives up, keeps on subduing his animal soul, the animal in him, and being victorious every day again. That's the hero of the Tanya. In the last chapter of Tanya, the author, the Alter Rebbe, focuses on the image of a soul. As the prophet tells us, the soul of man is a candle of God or a lamp of God. And the Zohar points to three different elements that comprise a lamp. There's a flame, there's a wick, and there's the oil. The flame in the in this uh, in the relation of the soul, the flame is the Shekhinah, the divine presence which rests upon the individual, the person. The wick is the body and the vitalizing animal soul who keeps the body alive and keeps the body moving, animates the body. The oil is the mitzvot and the good deeds that a person performs in the duration of his life. The oil and the wick both provide the mass necessary to be transformed into the energetic fire. The fire wants to burn, the fire cannot burn if it doesn't have a wick which is flammable. The, fire, the wick will disappear in a second if it doesn't have, if, it doesn't, if it's not continuously fed with the oil, with the um, uh, brown stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. Tanya quotes Moshe, and so we read in the last words, I'm going to read the, the last words of the Tanya. For as a result, you have the Dutch translation, I'm going to read the English translation, as a result of the transformation of the animal soul, originating from the Klippat Noga. Yeah? So when the, the animal soul performs the mitzvah, when someone performs the mitzvah, you're always doing an action, doing an action or even saying words when we bench or when we daven, uh, moving our hands when we shake the lulav uh, and the etrog, uh, igniting the candles uh, before Shabbat, we're making movements that cannot be made without a body and without a body that has an animated soul. So when one, trans with the transformation of the animal soul uh, to from darkness to light and so forth, this uh, brings forth the so-called ascent of the feminine water, which means a spiritual awakening on the initiative of the recipient, which in turn causes an arousal above, which is which results in or to draw the light of the shkina. He, Bechinat Gilur Oren Sof Baruch Hu, that is the category of the revealed light of the Blessed Ein Sof, Al Nafsho HaElokit Shever Mochin Shever Rosho, over one's divine soul, principally dwelling in the brain of his head. Thereby, will also Baze Yuvan Heiter. Yeah. So, what what Tanya is pointing at? What's the working of the lamp? How does the lamp work? When you have oil and you have a wick, which are, like I said, it, it's mess. It's not something, there, there, is, no, uh, there is no energy um, bursting out from the, neither from the wick or from the oil. But when you have the combination and the flame can feed itself on the oil, what's actually happening is the oil is being transformed and becomes part of the energy. They, you have an unbelievable transformation from something inanimate, uh, something mass and dead, into something living and uh, invigorating. And that's what, when, in the same way, when a living soul performs mitzvot here in this, on this planet, you're creating that transformation, you're causing that transformation of 
physical materialism becoming something spiritual and energetic and igniting. Ubazer, and Tanya concludes, Ubazer Yuban Heitev, Mashekatu, Ki Hashem Alokecha, Esh Ochla Hu. Thereby will also be clearly understood the text, for the Lord my God is a consuming fire. Tanya is referring, Tanya is quoting Moshe Rabbeinu. This is in Parashat Vahed Hanan, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, definitely in the book of Devarim, in, the, in his final parting words, Moshe Rabbeinu says to the Jewish people, you should adhere to the mitzvot, you should study Torah, remain loyal to the Torah, ki Hashem alokecha esh ochla, for the Hashem is a consuming fire. Is he trying to frighten them? Is he trying to uh, intimidate them? What does he what does he mean with this ki Hashem alokecha for Hashem, your God, is a consuming fire. What Tanya tells us is based on this understanding, just as a fire can only catch on an ab- object, when that object is being consumed by it, so too, regarding the light of the Shekhinah, in order for God to become your God, illuminating the Jew's soul, to have the Shekhinah rest upon your head, there must be a consume, a consu- there must be a consumption by the fire. The fire has to be fed. You have to give it something. Burning and annihilating the wick of the vivifying soul so that the soul of the klipa can be transformed into the fire of holiness. Moshe uses this uh, image of a fire. Moshe was very familiar with this image of a fire. Remember the first meeting that Hashem had with uh, Moshe? Yeah? Malach Hashem Elav, Belabat Esh, Mitoch Asmer, Bayar Vinei Asmer Boer Baesh, Vasmer Einen Ubuchal. The first time Hashem meets Moshe is the angel of God appears in a flame of fire, in the heart of the fire, from within the, the thorn bush. And behold, the thorn bush, bush was burning with fire, but the thorn bush, bush was not consumed. In a different source, the Balatanya, the Alter Rebbe, uh, taught a teaching of the Baal Shem Tov uh, on this pasuk. And he pointed out, and I think this connects very closely with, the, with this last point in Tanya, as actually the very last words of Tanya are, as will be explained somewhere else. In other words, if you finish the book and you think you know everything, here comes the last clear indication, there is more to learn. So the point being made of the person, the transformation that takes place in the person's own life, uh, and that serving as fuel for the godly fire. We have a problem with the Benuni because the Benuni doesn't get transformed. The Tzaddik gets transformed. The Tzaddik makes a total transformation. He's okay. But the Benuni doesn't get transformed. But there's this a nano, there's a fire that burns. The fire is a consuming fire, yet the bush will not be consumed. It doesn't say that the fire wasn't a consuming fire, but the thorn bush didn't get consumed. There is a fruit giving tree and there's a snap. The fruit giving tree is obviously qualitatively more valuable. The snap, the, burn, the thorn bush, is a simple thorn bush. It's also a living, uh, yeah, I better be careful. Uh, before I get the environmentalists over me, uh, it has a very, it's very valuable, no question about it, but it's not as a good producing uh, apple tree. In the snap, there's in the heart of the snap, the labat esh, there's the heart of the fire, there's a burning fire in that snap, and that snap, that, that, uh, that thorn bush 
is never going to be satisfied. The tzaddik himself, once he's experienced his high, he's okay. He's had it. He's had it. He's where he wants to be. He's in heaven. He's in heaven on earth. And so he, his thirst and his desire for godliness can be quenched. The Benini's thirst for godliness will never be quenched. It will never be enough. There's always more to give and there's always more to grow. The flame must consume, otherwise it will be extinguished. But the bush doesn't want to vanish. The blazing fire is never quieted, rather constantly experiencing an intense yearning to serve Hashem with happiness. But we obviously we don't conclude a book without starting a new one. And so on the bottom, all the way on the bottom, we have uh, we just have the Hebrew text without an English translation or a Dutch translation. Lukutei uh, Amarim Chelak Sheni. This is selected sayings, part two. Hanikrab Shem Chinuk Katan, also known as a little bit of education. The author, in his humbleness, says he just collected uh, sayings from books and authors. Miusad, um, it's all based, as the first part of Tanya was based on the Pasuk, Kikarove Lecha Davar Maod, that the, the thing is near to you and within reach. Um, with the speaking, uh, feeling, and doing. Um, the second part of Tanya is based on the um, Parshari Shonash of uh, expounding on the first um, paragraph of Kriyat Shema, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Atan, specifically on the oneness of Hashem. They say that when Tanya was first published, and uh, I can display here, I have, this is not a first edition, this is, uh, but this is a Tanya that was probably printed in Vilna probably a uh, hundred years ago, a bit uh, more than a hundred years ago. Um, this is the classics edition of Tanya. The classic uh, Tanya, nowadays, you can get all, uh, all kinds of editions, thank you, Will. You have all kinds of editions, larger, smaller, uh, digital, uh, you name it. But this is, uh, but this was the classical format of a Tanya, which is small. Yeah, we've seen the shas, we've seen the, we know what, what books usually look like. This is a, a pretty small format. And they say that when Rabbi Levi a colleague of the, uh, of the, the Balatanya. When he first saw the Tanya and he read it, he says his expression was, I'll say it in Yiddish, Azak Greiser Gott in Azak Kleinem Sefer. He put such a great God in such a small book. How did he do that? And uh, what that's actually in the second part of Tanya is much more theological, much more uh, in understanding what the one is. Uh, how how we should view uh, the oneness of Hashem. Um, <coughs> after learning the first part of Tanya, we know that it's not, not just interesting to explore, but it's something to apply and to implement. Uh, I, I was privileged to get a L'chaim, but everybody's going to get a chance. Don't. L'chaim. <laughs> Let me just keep you for another few minutes before we go. Because, uh, because we are, um, everybody's enjoying the party and everybody's welcome and it is uh, it is everybody's party, but there are a few individuals who really follow the lessons every time. Uh, and I know a lot of people watch recordings and uh, that's wonderful and, and uh, fantastic, but, uh, but it's still, I do appreciate when people actually log in and we can interact. Not everybody was able to make it here tonight, 
but I would like to take this opportunity to say, say a special thank you to them and give a little momentum of tonight. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Paul Jacobs, who's uh, uh, who's also uh, co-initiator initiator of this. Okay, and then uh, Hannah, uh, um, Now, the time. 